Hey geeks, welcome to a new video. Today I'm going to talk about Bison optimization. Besides working a lot with our own multi-objective optimization Socrates at Paridos, I really enjoyed using Bisopt the last weeks to solve single objective problems. I think to best possible apply it, you really need to understand it in a nice way. That's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to explain it to you step by step how it works, that you can get most out of it. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe the channel. And if you have feedback or comments, just drop them below. Let's get started. Let's start with an example for neural networks. If you have a neural network, you hardly know what is happening inside. But what you want to achieve is that you want to optimize, for example, the precision that it uh, finds stuff. So what you need to do normally is you have different hyperparameters like the learning rate or the batch size and many others that you can tune before you start the training to optimize the precision. If you look in more general on this problem, we just can call it, we have a black box problem where we don't know 100% what is really happening inside. We have a lot of different input variables and what we try to do is to optimize the target value, so what's coming out of the black box problem. And this is exactly where Bayesian optimization is really well suited to help you to find most efficiently or really efficiently the best target solution. How it works is an iterative process in this case. So we have uh, five steps that are partially uh, repeated iteratively. Um, I'm going to explain every step afterwards with an example in detail, but yeah, first you have an initial sampling set. So you need to start with something, so you start to have an initial sampling. After having this sampling, you evaluate all the samplings out of the initial samplings with the black box problem. So for our example before, you would have different training runs for neural networks to see how they perform based on their hyperparameters. Based on these results, you can start a training of a Gaussian process regressor. What this means in detail, we get to this later. Based on these results, you do a calculation of an acquisition function and you use this acquisition function, the last step, to identify the next to evaluate um, input. So you try to minimize that function and see which evaluation am I going to do next in the black box problem? And then you start the process over and over again until a certain uh, criterion is met. Let's start with a simple example where we have a black box problem where we only have one input, which is allowed to be in a range between 0 and 10. And we have also one target that we want to optimize. In this case, I take a mathematical function just for you to see clearly the conditions between and that we can later see how good the optimization were. So we take the input and we multiply it with the sign of the input. So let's take a look. I said we start with the initial sampling, which is in this case, you have a lot of different possibilities to do initial samplings like Latin hypercube sampling, uh, guessing, or just yeah a random crop so this is you don't have one option that is mandatory i just um, took a random crop here and have five samples which when i one after the other evaluate them have different target values like you can see here based on these values we have now and the correct input values based on them we can now train our gaussian process regressor it looks like this. So we have now two different indicators here. I'm going to explain them to you. So the difference in Gaussian Proton regressors is you don't train like one regression function, but you rather train a set of a lot of different tuned regression functions with different kernels, different tails. And what you do is the blue line is the mean of all predictions of all functions while the yellow area indicates the uncertainty of the model and is the standard deviation of all models and their predictions. 
So you can see here, obviously, when we don't have noise at all points, when we have a sample, there's no uncertainty, while the more the points are out away from each other, the uncertainty rises. In the next step, we now have our uh, Gaussian process regressor and we start to do our, our acquisition function. Um, what is an acquisition function? Basically, you can have a lot of different approaches, but it's somehow a mathematical function describing a gain or potential optimization volume by a function. In this case, I took a very uh, common one. It's called lower confidence bound. Some know it as upper confidence bound. What it says is the acquisition function means that we take the normal standard, we take the mean, so the blue line, and we take from that the standard deviation times kappa. Kappa at this place is a hyperparameter. So it just, you're gonna see it later, depending how I choose this kappa, my optimization is gonna be more locally focused or more global focused. At this point, I just want to let you know that we talk here about a minimization problem. I forgot to tell this before. So our goal is to get a target as small as possible. I did the same acquisition function on the right, taking a kappa of 10, just for you to get a first feeling how it looks like. Um, what you can see, like depending how big my kappa is, the more my uncertainty gains in value. And in this point, for example, we see that for both, we more or less sample at a value between four and six, but still for the kappa that is 10, the value is more or less between five or six and for the kappa with one, it is near to four. Sampling now, these two values will lead us to a new point and we start our iteration. So we now have one more point that we evaluate. So we retrain our model. And what you can now see really beautifully here, on the left side where we have the acquisition function with kappa one, the next sample that we should do is still very close to already the one that we did now. And where we have the kappa 10 on the other side, you can see that it's far away. So it's at a totally new point because the uncertainties are much higher prioritized. So here we sample at 10, at the other one we sample at one, uh, not at one, sorry, at five. And what you see here is now the model for kappa 10 we have a really, really good point actually there, um, but the model didn't expect the point to be so low, so the uncertainties rise. And this process now is actually repeated iteratively, so it's done one more time. And as you see, the best point that is found by kappa one is more or less between four and six. And you see that the samples are getting very close to each other already, while with a kappa of 10, we still try to go in a wide variety. So now the next sample point would be between zero and two. We can now iterate this process as long as we want, or we can say, okay, stop condition is I only have 20 runs because the training is expensive or I want to converge in such a way. But in the end, yeah, this is up to you. And uh, it's probably an own topic or video to talk about this. But now what is interesting in the end, we can see it more or less already that in this time kappa with 10 was better, but just taking a look in the end on the real function, we see that the hyperparameter we choose is really mandatory or has a big impact if we find the best point or if we find just the locally best point. And um, I'm gonna do a video about hyperparameter tuning soon for exactly these optimization problems. Um, for now, I just hope that you enjoy. That's it. That's all you needed to know to start with Bayesian optimization. Wasn't that hard, wasn't it? If you want to get even deeper into some parts like acquisition functions, just drop in the comments below what you are missing or where you want to go deep in and I make a video about it. In general, don't forget to subscribe to stay always up to date with the topics that we are providing for you. I wish you a nice day and keep optimizing.